Well, you're pretty good at uh, keeping order among the unruly students on this committee. So I, I think your, uh, your earlier training did well. Um, let me start with you, Dr. Burke. Uh, and this is a question, but any of you I, I would invite to answer. Uh, you know, we know we obviously have shortage overall, but we have acute shortages in specific areas. Special ed obviously has been mentioned. Uh, math and science usually uh, also reach that. What? Yeah, and yet in most school systems, now pay is pretty uniform. It's based on seniority and, and credentials overall. Is there merit in uh, doing what they do at the college level, which is as a guy that was a history professor in college, I can tell you, I didn't make what anybody in the engineering department made or anybody at the business school made. Uh, and uh, and I, I don't begrudge them that. I don't mean that critically of anybody. I was just, my skill was less, more, more common, more available than the others. So uh, would, would it be worthwhile to, having pay differentials to, in specific shortage areas to try and attract more people and retain them for longer? Thank you, Representative Cole. I, that would definitely be worthwhile, thinking about how districts can differentiate pay for high demand areas, not only for high demand areas, but to differentiate pay to reward teachers who are doing excellent work in the classroom, who are getting their, their cohorts of students to learn a year or a year and a half worth of learning in a year's time to really reward those exceptional teachers. But schools have largely made a decision to take existing resources, which as I mentioned earlier, have increased significantly over the past half century, and to use those taxpayer resources to fund and hire non-teaching staff instead of putting that into something like differentiated teacher salaries. So again, if we just look at the recent data, if you go back just to the year 2000 from 2000 to 2019, while the number of students and teachers in public schools just increased about 8%, the number of principals and assistant principals increased 37%, and the number of school district administrative staff increased 88%. So again, this is about decisions, about choices that districts are making. And we can look at those overall aggregate numbers. If we go back even further, back to 1950, I mentioned spending increasing significantly since that time period. A big part of that is this increase in non-teaching staff. The number of students increased about 100% from 1950 forward, but the number of teachers increased 243%. The number of administrators and non-teaching staff increased 709% over that time period. So you're absolutely right, differentiated pay is critically important. Rewarding excellent teachers uh, with differentiated pay is important, but that will require making different decisions than schools have made in the past. Let me ask you a quick follow-up, and again, I'd invite anybody else if they've got uh, thoughts on this to participate. Um, you know, we're the federal government. We can't and should not, in my opinion, be mandating these kinds of things from here. Um, we can incentivize behaviors, though, that we like, either through programs, and, and we try to do that on some occasions. As you think broadly across the country, is there anybody doing what we're talking about? I mean, is there any particular system you would say uh, they, they approach this a little bit differently than most of the states and this is working better? Well, I think what we can point to is something that we saw in the wake of COVID, which is how diverse the delivery of instruction is becoming and the way in which that has enabled uh, individuals to enter teaching and to be rewarded. So if we think about something like learning pods and micro schools, these really innovative approaches that are on the ground. Uh, these options enable pe teachers to be paid directly from families. And really, you know, you can imagine a situation where the sky is the limit in terms of earning potential for these instructors. And, and hopefully that is where we get to, to a point where these excellent in-demand teachers are rewarded handsomely. Let me, Dr. Corbett Thomas, I don't have a lot of time left, but let me turn to you because I couldn't agree more with your basic point about the importance of diversity in the teaching or in, and kids seeing people that look like themselves pursuing the profession. Uh, we know our record's not what any of us would want it to be in that regard. Again, is there a particular place or uh, state or system, in your opinion, that are handling this better that we should look at? Uh, these are folks that are aggressively recruiting for diversity or, uh, and achieving this goal. Yeah, thank you for the question, um, Representative Cole. 
Um, absolutely, there are um, programs like those um, funded by some of the programs I talked about today, the TQP, like teacher residencies um, that have become very um, uh, popular uh, across the country. And there are states like California that are investing, um, uh, making considerable investments in teacher residency programs. And we know that these programs tend to have much higher um, levels of diversity than um, the, the teacher workforce at large. And that's largely because um, it's comprehensive preparation, but um, residents also receive a stipend uh, during their residency year. They um, receive ongoing mentoring support. Um, they receive uh, aligned clinical experience that is really deep. It lasts typically a full school year um, while they're also completing coursework. Um, and they tend to have much higher retention rates than um, do um, teachers prepared through other pathways. So it's a very promising model that um, we see being invested in. And, you know, in California, uh, we're starting to see uh, an uptick in teacher preparation enrollments, which really defies uh, the national trend uh, because of those considerable investments, but there's still uh, quite a bit of need. And so these kinds of investments are still much needed. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, just uh, uh, for purposes of, of notifying you, for whatever reason, I, I don't see time on my schedule. So I'm guessing I've about used up my time. If I've gone over, I apologize, but uh, uh, might help if there's some way we could get that displayed on the screen. With that, I yield back. I think you're muted, Madam Chair. I thought it would, I thought I did that. In any case, Ms. Weingarten had her hand raised to answer your question. So I'll, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I apologize. Yep. I would, I would have additional time here. Go ahead. So, um, um, Congressman Cole, I think that we, there are ways in which we can do, and there have been various different collective bargaining agreements that have um, differentiated pay for shortage areas for special needs, like you know, Dr. West was talking about. Uh, we've done that a lot. Um, the programs that paid for performance did not work. In fact, they actually hurt. You know, you're you're seeing a slow walk away from all the um, uh, race to the top, um, pay for performance, because what was happening is that people actually left the high need schools where you actually need to have kids, you need to have the best and most well-prepared teachers. So the pay for shortage areas is a really good idea. And we have done that in a bunch of different contracts, but the bottom line is you actually have to have decent pay as the basis of it. People have to rely year after year on being able to feed their families and being able to rely on that kind of income. And that's important as well. And then you can do various different differentials. And the last thing I would say is I agree with Dr. Burke that there have been too many non-classroom um, positions that have been created, but a lot of that is because of paperwork and the federal accountability systems in terms of, and that's part of the reason why we are seeking to actually change the accountability systems to really focus on what kids need to know and be able to do and make sure that the data is there. But what's happened is that there is a search for data and there's more and more time that is focused on data collection as opposed to on teaching. And that's why it's one of the number one issues that current teachers have in terms of saying, let me teach, give me the time, tools, and trust so that I can actually meet the needs of my kids. Yeah, I'm shocked the federal government would generate paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. You're back. 